Hey, sorry for uh, the slow start, folks. We had some technical issues. We also had some traffic issues that delayed uh, some of the candidates and perhaps some of um, some of the folks who signed up to be here tonight. But I want to thank everybody for coming. I'm Brian Shoup. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Natural Resources Council. Um, since 1963, VNRC has worked at the local, regional, and state level to advance policies and programs that promote clean water and the restoration of our streams, rivers, and the protection of our groundwater, um, the protection of our forests, and all of the many benefits that they provide to wildlife and to Vermonters, including economic, environmental, and, and ecological and cultural benefits. Um, we've worked to protect Vermonters from uh, exposure to toxic uh, chemicals. We have worked to promote sustainable community development, including affordable housing and smart growth locations, the viability of our downtowns and villages, transportation options in our working lands, and we also are on an ongoing mission to combat climate change, to do our part in Vermont to reduce emissions, to make the problem worse, and also to prepare Vermont for a changing, warmer world, which is already underway. Um, we do all that through advocacy, through litigation, and through public education and outreach. One thing that VNRC does not do is endorse candidates or encourage our members or the general public to vote in any particular way in an election. We do, however, raise awareness around the issues that are important to us and our members um, and hopefully share that information so that you and all Vermonters can make informed choices when they go to the ballot boxes in November. And that's what we're all about here tonight, is raising awareness about the issues that are important to all of us. So that's my introduction. Thank you again for coming. I want to thank the candidates for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Lauren Hurl, with Vermont Conservation Voters. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And I know I'm really excited to hear from these congressional candidates and grateful for their time and uh, being here with us this evening. My name is Lauren Hurl and I'm the executive director of Vermont Conservation Voters. And VCV is in its 40th year serving as the nonpartisan political action arm of Vermont's environmental community. We advocate for strong environmental laws, hold lawmakers accountable, and help support candidates who share our vision and values. We believe that a bright future for Vermont includes working to advance and defend policies that protect the environment, promote health, foster social, racial, and economic justice, bolster strong communities, and strengthen our democracy. We're really excited to be here at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. And this event is also being live streamed and there was a lot of interest in people watching it from home and we're really grateful to those of you who came out to be with us tonight. It's, it's fun to have an actual in-person event. Um, and we're grateful to Orca Media for uh, live streaming and uh, recording this event for us. And we know that voters are really eager to hear from these candidates for Vermont seat in the US House of Representatives particularly this being the first race in 16 years that there's not an incumbent running. Um, so lots of interest and we're really looking for a lively discussion this evening about some of the biggest issues facing our state and nation, including the climate crisis, clean water, protecting biodiversity, housing and democracy. Our moderator this evening is Stephen Pappas, who's the publisher and executive editor of the Times Argus Rutland Herald. Thanks Steve for joining us this evening. And for participants in the forum, we are really excited to be joined by Becca Ballant, who is a former middle school teacher, historian. She has served four terms in the Vermont Senate, is the first woman and first openly gay person to be president pro tempore of the Vermont Senate. She's running as a Democrat. Molly Gray, who is a former congressional staffer, worked at the International Committee of the Red Cross, served as an assistant state attorney general, and is currently serving as lieutenant governor of Vermont. She's also running as a Democrat. And finally, Liam Madden, who is a Marine Corps veteran, national anti-war leader, MIT climate change solver, and winner of a human rights award from the Institute for Policy Studies, and he's running as an independent. So thanks again for being here. I'm now gonna turn it over to Sheldon Goodwin of Vermont Conservation Voters to walk through a few of the details for the event. Hi 
everyone, I'm Sheldon, um, and I wanted to, again, thank you all for being here. I'm going to walk through a little bit of what the evening will entail. Um, so first, um, as Lauren just mentioned, we're going to hear from the different candidates who have joined us here today. Um, and we invited all the candidates who registered with the Secretary of State to participate in this forum. Um, and to be eligible to participate, candidates must have filed for office um, and demonstrated at least one of the following has received 5% or more of the vote in a previous statewide general election or primary, has polled at 5% or higher, of, or higher in a primary or general election poll conducted by an independent professional pollster, or has raised at least $35,000 or received contributions from at least 1,500 Vermonters. And we set these criteria so that our members have a chance to hear in depth from the leading candidates. And we will also provide space at the end of the e um, event uh, for candidates who did not qualify for the forum to give a brief introduction of um, themselves before the meet and greet. Um, so before we begin, I just want to remind everyone to please silence your cell phones and also to remember that we are asking everyone to wear a mask um, when not actively eating or drinking. Um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Steve. Am I working? Great. So first and foremost, uh, thank you, Becca, Molly, and Liam for joining us today. Um, and thank you to It's a pleasure to be able to hear the candidates discuss such important issues right now. And uh, you're the reason we're gathered here. Um, despite what you hear, uh, newspapers remain uh, critical to the underpinning of democracy. And the Times Argus and the Rutland Herald are pleased to be part of today's forum on topics that are important to every single Vermonter. Uh, because knowledge is power. And being informed is critical to making informed decisions. And for that reason alone, uh, all of us are so grateful that you all are here to better understand what differentiates these individuals. And so with that, we're going to get started. Um, the questions for this evening's event came from BCV and VNRC staff and from input from audience members for this event. For each question, each candidate will have two minutes to answer the question. A timer will be indicating when you have one minute left, 30 seconds left, and when your time is up. Um, as a moderator, I reserve the right to ask uh, a follow-up question. Um, sorry, that's the way that goes. <laughs> um, and I will ask the questions uh, in alphabetical order by last name, so Becca first, Molly, and then Liam as one, two, and three, and then we'll rotate through. So the second question will be two, three, one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I do want to stress that we're going to hold folks to the two minute uh, scope, I guess, uh, the, the two minute time limit, um, and we ask that everybody be civil and cordial and respectful. Um, we're going to dive right into the questions uh, in a moment, and we'll allow each candidate to have two minutes for concluding comments at the end. So there will be no opening remarks. So with that, we're going to hop right in. So the climate crisis is perhaps the most pressing issue facing our country. Uh, what are some concrete examples of leadership roles that you've played and policies you've helped drive to address this critical issue? And Becca, if you would go first. Sure. So just testing, everybody can hear me in the back? Okay, great. So yes, it is um, the existential crisis of our lifetime. And I talk about this a lot with, with my two children. And I've done quite a bit uh, during my time in the legislature, both as majority leader in the state Senate and as the president of the Senate, to try to pass bills that will address the climate crisis. And so one of the first significant uh, bills that we were able to pass concerning the climate crisis was the Global Warming Solutions Act. And without my leadership, 
I feel certain that this would not have been able to pass the Senate. It was something I worked very, very hard on. And it set up a model for us to have a climate council to make recommendations to us. And despite having a lot of support both in the House and the Senate, the governor did veto that legislation. And then as majority leader, I had to go back and make sure that we had the votes to override the veto. We passed um, this most recent um, session. We also passed the clean heat standard, which um, again, the governor vetoed. We did have the votes in the Senate to override. The, the House did not. We passed the first environmental justice bill uh, in Vermont, and that was um, a bill that was introduced by my colleague, Keisha Rahm, and worked closely with her and the chair of the Senate um, Natural Resources Committee to make sure that that was passed. And we have done huge, huge investments in weatherization making sure it's more affordable for low and moderate income Vermonters and making sure that we benefit from the crisis in terms of us rejuvenating the economy around the Green New Deal. And I think we have a tremendous opportunity here, although it is a very scary time for so many of us, it's an also an opportunity for us. Thank you. Molly? Well, first off, Good evening, everyone, and make sure you can hear me okay. I don't think the mic is on, but closer. Okay, we'll bring it closer. Is that better? Yes. But, okay. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I just want to start by thanking VNRC and VCV for hosting. Uh, I'll just jump right in. Uh, I grew up here in Vermont on a vegetable and dairy farm. I spent much of my high school and college years ski racing across Vermont um, as a competitive ski racer. Without question, I know that climate change is impacting all of us in, in deeply personal ways, be it um, in ways that relate to the outdoors and our livelihoods, our economy. And to speak to my career and advocacy around climate action specifically, um, not only did I work for the International Committee of the Red Cross, an organization that works in conflict zones, conflicts that are often started by climate crisis, and I have seen what climate displacement looks like firsthand, but I went to law school to study international human rights law and was here in Vermont, one of the top environmental law schools in the country, where I was on the Vermont Journal of Environmental Law. I served as a symposium editor, helping to host one of the first uh, symposiums that the law school has ever had on climate change and national security. And that was in um, the 2011-2012. As Lieutenant Governor, I've worked to bring Vermonters from across the state into my office, hosting a regular seat at the table series and focusing on climate related issues. One, the intersection between climate change and food insecurity, which we saw not only during the pandemic, but we're seeing it every single day. Uh, two, most recently, bringing together leaders in the state who have worked to build our workforce as it relates to climate jobs, the, the jobs needed to weatherize homes, the jobs needed to deploy solar, and certainly as Vermont's congresswoman, want to sit on the Energy and Commerce Committee so I can bring our leadership here in Vermont to Washington and make sure that we're investing properly in what we're doing here. Hi, everybody. I have no policy experience. I'm not a public servant yet. Um, my role has been as a, in a, an innovator in the nonprofit and private sector and as someone who's dedicated my life to addressing climate change as a renewable energy professional. Um, my role in this campaign is to bring perspectives to the policy discussion that I'm not hearing. And as a renewable energy professional, I obviously think renewables play an important role in our future. But um, what I'm not hearing enough is how the Democratic Party is basically just sugarcoating the reduction in fossil fuels that we need and the transformation of our economic system that we need with all the upside of green new jobs and green new energy. But the problem is somewhere along the line, they lost track of the medicine that should go with the sugar, and they kept only the sugar. Because nowhere in the Green New Deal do they mention reductions in fossil fuel use, and the cap that we need, and the uh, ongoing reductions in that cap that we need, nor do they mention limits to economic growth. So what the Democratic Party is doing, in my opinion, is not going to work, 
And the simplest thing we can do is reduce or cap and reduce the amount of fossil fuels we use. And I'm not hearing that in any or seeing that in any of the stated policy positions of the Democrats in this race. Never mind do I hear mention of the more complex issue of creating and designing and implementing a steady state economy so that if we're going to try and address climate change at a root cause level, then our highest priority, in my opinion, needs to be innovating a more inclusive and powerful way of collectively solving problems. And that's the only way we can navigate with enough public buy-in this scary task before us of creating a paradigm shift in our economic system. stress that this is a discussion, a forum, uh, and a discussion we will not be debating tonight. So I just want to make that clear and reiterate to the candidates and mostly to the audience, um, just because we, we have three very different points of view here uh, coming at us. So uh, second question, uh, and thank you all for your answers. Uh, whether it's the health of our surface waters like Lake Champlain or the safety of our drinking water, Clean water is essential. Um, what do you think are the most pressing water-related issues we face? And if elected, what actions would you take to ensure access to clean water for all Vermonters? Um, with Molly. Sure. I mean, access to clean water is everything for us here in Vermont. It's not only our springs and wells and being able to turn on the tap and have um, access to water in our homes, but it's also access to water for our farmers, um, for our food produ producers. It's linked to economic security, climate security, food security. I think we've been incredibly well served by Senator Leahy and being such a champion for our great lake, Lake Champlain. Uh, certainly as Vermont's Congresswoman, I would be focused um, on carrying on that leadership and making sure that our lake remains clean. I think there's significant challenges still around phosphorus. Um, and pollution making water challenging and, and inaccessible at times. I would certainly support the Clean Water Act and leadership that we've seen from our congressional delegation on that front, and also making sure that we're holding corporate polluters accountable. We've seen here in Vermont with PFAS contamination in Bennington that um, folks uh, trying to access medical monitoring. There's obviously been a lot of leadership here in the state, and we're tremendously lucky to have uh, Senator Sears and Senator Campion down in Bennington, including legislative leaders like Senator Ballin, who have, have led on med medical monitoring. But it also comes down to making sure that we're expanding corporate liability and holding corporate polluters accountable. Thank you. Uh, Liam, you're next. Well, to be upfront, water is a human right. And I am in favor of keeping water a public utility that is as democratically controlled as pro possible and restricting and opposing privatization of water systems and including much more uh, s strong disincentives to bottled water. And the big picture, I don't believe there's anything that rivals climate change as an environmental issue as much as food and water. And agriculture is intimately tied up with water use. It uses by far the most water of any of our human activities. And so it's bound up with how I approach agriculture, which if I had to briefly discuss it now, because I'm sure we'll go into more depth later, I support uh, removing subsidies from big monoculture, chemically dependent agriculture operations and transferring those subsidies to regenerative, smaller, more equitably owned enterprises. Uh, in the meantime, short of a paradigm shift in uh, how we operate agriculture in this, in this world and in this country, I would say the existing legislation that is most piquing my interest, of course, obviously supporting the Clean Water Act is just a, a no-brainer and a given, but uh, in terms of new water system regulations, there's the Water Affordability, Transparency, Equity, and Reliability Act, which is a mouthful. It stands as an acronym WATER, the WATER Act. I think that's promising. It works to uh, clean up, repair, and modernize existing water infrastructure for places that are uh, woefully needing it, like Flint, Michigan. So that's where I stand on water. It's a human right, and we need to protect it, care for it, and treat it as sacred. It is as important as the climate. Thank you. Becca. So I really 
started thinking really deeply about the health and safety of our water when I lived in El Salvador. I lived and worked in San Salvador and was um, shocked to see the extent to which people had no access to clean water. And my health was directly impacted by that, and that was something that I carried with me for a long time afterwards. And so we do often take it for granted here. But when I served in the legislature, it was something that I took very seriously, that what happened in Flint was something that could happen here if we weren't um, very vigilant. And as the Lieutenant Governor has said, we did a lot of work around PFAS and PFOS, um, certainly um, directing our attention to what happened in Bennington, but we know we're going to see more of that around the state. So we had um, work that we did here that I know is work that we're going to have to continue to do at the federal level, um, really concentrating on banning PFAS from all kinds of products, including uh, rugs, carpets, firefighter foam, those um, items that we have banned it from here, continuing the work that, that we've done on regulating PFAS contamination in water, making sure we're keeping those toxic chemicals out of children's toys like we have been working on here. And you know, we have been a model in so many ways on the issue of medical monitoring. And I just want to remind everybody, um, or maybe tell you for the first time if you didn't know, we had to take three different runs at that. We passed it three different times before we could convince this governor that he should sign on. And that is the kind of dogged work that I will do for you uh, if I am fortunate enough to represent you in Congress. You don't always have success the first time out. You've got to keep working at it. Um, before we go on to the third question, I just want to check technically. Can everybody hear the candidates okay? You're hard to hear. I'm always hard to hear. Uh, okay. And are, are you getting okay feed for? Okay, great. Um, so, next, what federal policies would you support to bring in state renewable energy to Vermont? Um, and with this one, we're going to start with you, Liam. Like I said, I think it's important to start with, I, I am a renewable energy professional. It's what I do as my day job. Um, I think it plays an important role in our energy future. Um, and I think we should continue the, the federal tax credit. I think we should make that more of a tax rebate so it's more accessible to lower and middle income people because it's clear that uh, you need a really large tax appetite for the existing incentive structure to really apply to you and that doesn't make any sense. However, the bigger picture I want to press home is that most people probably don't realize the um, Harvard professor David Keith did a research paper in the journal uh, Environmental Research Letters in which he cited how much land it would take to transition to renewable energy as our primary energy source. And it would take, this is a shocking number, but I've checked it, it's 72% of American land would be needed to fully meet our energy needs via wind farms and 6% via um, solar energy. And I, I checked his math on solar energy and I think he's being very conservative. I think it's more. And so that is just a completely unacceptable amount of land. It is almost more than the amount we have under arable crop production. So I am for renewable energy. I have dedicated my life. I think there is a role for it. But if we want a technologically advanced industrial civilization, we need to open our mind to how much safer and more reliable nuclear energy has become in the last several decades. The Plants are safer, they can be, um, the reactors can be produced in a mass production line, making them more affordable, and we can recycle the waste. The only reason the waste is not being recycled right now is because there's a law from the 1970s stopping us, but that's what France does. And if we don't open our minds to a, a nuclear-powered future, by and large, with some important help from renewable energy, uh, we are going to do a lot to save civilization, but destroy the natural world. And I am opposing that. Thank you. So I want to uh, agree with Liam that I think one piece of low-hanging fruit that we can deal with right now is making sure that we continue the tax credit that has helped so many uh, solar uh, installers here in Vermont over, over the last decade. And it was at 30% 
of a tax credit under George W. Bush, and it has steadily declined, and now we're down to 22 percent, and if Congress doesn't act, it's going to go away entirely. I want to see an investment in this area. I know that we used to lead uh, not just New England, but many parts of the nation in our solar energy, and it was not just a way for us re to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, they were also really good paying jobs. So that's one thing that um, I'm very committed to. The other thing is that we have to make it much more affordable for people here in Vermont to transition to renewables. And so uh, many of you I'm sure know that if you want to install uh, a heat pump in your home, if you want to install, install uh, solar panels, most Vermonters, average Vermonters, cannot afford to do that. Many of them want to, but they can't afford to do it. They don't have the money up front. So we have got to put our money where our mouth is. If we want people, and we do, to transition off, we have to not be uh, constantly in a position of shaking our heads, why don't more people do it? More people don't do it because they can't afford it. And this is a place where federal funds certainly uh, would help a great deal. Um, I have 30 seconds left. I want to make sure uh, that I say this last piece. Something that I feel like is holding us up is the level of despondency that many people feel about how to be someone who is more of a climate champion because they feel hamstrung because they don't have the resources to invest or they don't even know where to begin. So some of the work that we all have to do as people who care about these issues is reminding people don't let the despondency get in the way of progress. Thank you. Oh. I want to start by uh, sharing a little bit of, I guess, personal insight into my own upbringing. Uh, I grew up in a house where we didn't have a dryer. Uh, we didn't have a dishwasher. We didn't have a microwave. We cut all of our own wood and um, put it in the basement in the summer and in the fall um, and hung up clothes on racks. And uh, in some ways, I think my folks were sort of OG environmentalists, um, but actually they were really concerned just about the cost of energy and being able to afford it um, before. Uh, and I think those are conversations we're all having today. But when I think about how do we make renewable energy accessible in Vermont, it really comes back to me to that energy security. And how can we, regardless of what's happening in Ukraine, regardless of what's happening around the country, that Vermonters have energy independence and energy security every day. So if we take that one step further when it comes to renewables, I think that what we've done in the state to make solar accessible, we've, take, we've done a great job, but there's still a lot we can do around um, community solar projects, for example. But even with strong investments, and I fully agree with my colleagues here tonight about um, continuing incentives and tax credits federally, we don't have the workforce. And so it doesn't matter how much money right now we push at solar in Vermont until we have young people wanting to be solar deployers and going into the trades and signing up to be part of the incredible unions that we have here in Vermont, we're actually not going to be able to meet our climate goals. So for me, that's a top priority, making sure that we're getting kids coming out of our um, career and technical education centers, going into associate's degrees and degrees at VTC and schools right here in the state, and then going right into jobs at Sun Common um, and with our solar, deploy our solar panel deployers across the state. I think that's an incredibly important component and something that Congress, where Congress has a big role to play. And it's a good reminder that we all have to get our wood in pretty quick. <laughs> um, we're gonna switch to biodiversity now. Uh, a recent study found that every 30 seconds, the United States loses a football field worth of natural area to roads, pipelines, urban sprawl, and other development. To address this, President Biden signed an executive order committing the U.S. to protect 30 percent of its land and waters by 2030. Do you support this effort, and what specifically do you think Congress should do to address the biodiversity crisis and the ongoing loss of habitat in the United States? We're going to start with Becca. So yes, I, I do support this, um, not just because it protects biodiversity, um, and not because it, uh, not only because it protects our, our flora and fauna, but also because it is better for us as humans. We know that the forest economy, uh, rather, excuse me, the forest ecology, is 
what often gives people a sense of peace and well-being. We, it is, study after study has linked it to um, mental health, um, you know, a, a way for people to get uh, mental health um, calm and it increases our, our levels of uh, stress relief. And so it is not just uh, an issue around bi biodiversity, but also it, it's better for us as human beings. And it's one of the reasons why I walk every day with my dog in the woods. But to your specific question of you know, what other initiatives would, would I support, um, we have to do everything that we can to safeguard and protect um, mature and old growth forests. Um, and we need to really make sure we take uh, a science approach to uh, protecting um, wildfire risk. We know that this is also uh, a problem right now that we're facing. Our, our wildfire season is getting longer, it's getting hotter. We're losing more acreage every year. That is a, a, a part of uh, the climate catastrophe. I would also strengthen the partnerships that we have across the country uh, with local economies and states to make sure that we're retaining uh, forest ecosystems that will support not just the people who live in that area, but also the, the forest economy. And we, we do a, a good job of that here in Vermont. And we also have to look beyond our borders. We as a, as a country need to invest in making sure that we can combat um, global deforestation, that, that that global deforestation impacts us directly here too. We have to also look beyond our borders. Thank you. Thank you. Molly. I absolutely support the president's executive order on 30% by 2030 of protecting our our land and also our waters. I think what's really exciting about the executive order and also really important as we approach all of our con conversations around conservation, excuse me, um, is that who, who do we have at the table? Do we have our um, sportsmen and women, our, you know, here in Vermont, our skiers and our snowmobilers and people who are outside, um, those who are working our lands, our indigenous communities, our small business owners, and trying to bring as many stakeholders to the table. So this isn't a one party against another, but is how do we protect the land and environment we love so much. And I want to share briefly, um, I was down in Manchester recently and I met with Orvis, and Orvis was telling me how together with Protect Our Winters, an organization of groups that is working to advocate for um, climate action. And Orvis has a pretty unique following. They've got a lot of Republicans and Democrats, um, sportsmen, and they figured out a way to go to Capitol Hill and get Republicans to think about environmental protection, to think about climate action, and to start acting slowly. And so I think, and when I think about leadership in this moment, and not only addressing the president's executive order and carrying that forward, but also how do we do it? It's also making sure that we have those stakeholders at the table in the process. Yes, I definitely support protecting more of our biodiversity than even 30% of, of federal lands. I think it could go farther. Um, what would I do in addition to that, what I urge Congress to do or be part of Congress doing is uh, invest more in smart development patterns, so clustered communities, less uh, sprawl in parking lots, which hurt my soul. Um, more d investment in public transportation infrastructure, uh, transferring the stewardship of federal lands to indigenous communities, and investing in marine permaculture, which I can explain what that is a little bit uh, down the line. It's a way of in, uh, invigorating life back into the oceans and creating sustainable fisheries. Um, so regenerative agriculture obviously affects the biodiversity of our surrounding ecosystems because spraying things with pesticides uh, just undermines the base of biodiversity and the adjacent surroundings. Um, but I think the, the thing that's calling to me to urge into this conversation is that we take a step back and remember that climate change is only one small part of a larger sustainability crisis. Because we have fished over 90% of the big fish out of the ocean. We are extincting species at perhaps thousands of times the background rate. And we are depleting our precious natural resources, including fossil fuels, at a rate that will make them gone in our lifetimes. So if we are too narrowly focused on climate and not on broader sustainability issues, I think we might lose the forest for the trees. And it's important not only so that we 
make good policy, but so that we can be more inclusive in the conversation. Because I feel like we can get more people who are conservative involved in this discussion when you frame it as a sustainability issue and frame it at the things that they love that they might lose if we don't act, instead of just a carbon dioxide is bad and we need to uh, move heaven and hell to reduce it. So now I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball question. Um, who is an environmental leader who played a pivotal role in shaping your environmental values and why? And we're going to start with Molly. Uh, actually, I was talking earlier about how I grew up. And while it was really frustrating at the time to have to shake out wet clothes and hang them up on the line and cut wood all fall, um, can tomatoes and freeze vegetables. Um, I'd say my folks instilled a pretty strong environmental ethic. And as my husband knows who's here, we, uh, you know, I reuse, recycle just about everything. Um, and now we've got a garden going in the backyard. And yeah, I guess uh, I owe them a lot and I really appreciate their leadership. I'm also deeply proud to be endorsed and supported by Todd Stern, who is the chief negotiator of the Paris Climate Agreement. And as an international lawyer, uh, he's kind of a superhero in where he got us, where he brought us to as a country, and where he brought us to as a world in terms of having some framework. I think it's an absolute shame that uh, the Trump administration in June 2018 pulled out of the Paris Agreement. And we're sort of coming back now in terms of our own uh, dependability as a nation. Um, another person I admire uh, tremendously. And I'll leave it there. Uh, so I'll, I'll segment this question into a couple. The innovator, who I think is currently doing the most exciting and inspiring work to me, is Dr. Brian Von Herzen, who won the X Prize for Marine Permaculture. Um, he's the, the head of the Climate Foundation. Brilliant person. We should all look him up. Um, Bill Mollison is the founder of Permaculture, and I would say that extends down to all the people who taught me permaculture on the local level. Wendell Berry, the author and uh, champion of more perennial agriculture is someone I find completely inspiring. But in my personal life by far, it is uh, an author and philosopher named Dr. Bill Plotkin, who wrote a book called Nature and the Human Soul that has been completely transformative in my life. And I think it's, uh, in summary, teaching us to fall in love with the natural world as kind of a prerequisite to being a whole and healthy human. Oh, so many. Um, is this still on? Can you hear me in the back? There we go. OK. So uh, if, I, if I take it sort of chronologically, um, was very impacted by Wendell Berry and actually had at my own wedding uh, people reading excerpts from Wendell Berry to send us off right into the world. Um, Vandana Shiva, a huge hero of mine. Um, Bill McKibben, who many of you know and love and who uh, endorsed me today in this race. I was very proud to have his endorsement. Catherine Hayhoe, who is an evangelical Chris Christian climate champion. I've learned a lot from her over the last few years. Um, but uh, closer to home, I would say all of the people throughout my time working at the Farm and Wilderness Foundation in Plymouth, Vermont, um, originally moved here to Vermont to take a job there, leading uh, service trips um, with teens at the Farm and Wilderness Foundation, worked there for many years, went on to direct one of the, the camps. And so many of the people that I worked with there instilled in me and in my wife, I swear I met her, and our children who go there now, uh, this incredible, incredible love of the natural world and this deep desire to protect it. And I have made some of the greatest friendships of my life through that organization. And if you're not familiar with it and you have a, a kid who is of summer camp age, you might want to check it out. It's really quite an extraordinary organization. Thank you. And I would remind everyone that this forum is being brought to you by VCV and VNRC, not the Independent Booksellers Association. <laughs> um, we're, next, we're going to talk about uh, social justice and equity. 
Um, June is Pride Month, and there have obviously been many issues in recent years pertaining to LGBTQIA rights and other social and racial justice issues. Um, what steps do we really need to be taking to build a more equitable Vermont and a more equitable United States? And we're going to start. Just two minutes. Huh? I, said, I was joking. I well, this is where we transition to two hours each. <laughs> um, but we're going to start with Liam for only two minutes. How can we transition to a more equitable society? Yeah. So my definition of justice is best served and best embodied by enacting it through economic justice and environmental justice, or, and um, political justice. So on the economic justice front, that means giving the uh, preference for the work that needs to be done to build a more just and sustainable world to democratically and equitably run enterprises. And that means, in layman's terms, workers' cooperatives, as well as to uh, large civilian service corps that would be part of a larger federal jobs guarantee. So uh, political justice to me means, of course, equal equal justice under the law, but it also means giving people realistic mechanisms to bypass politicians who don't listen to them. Princeton University did a study five years ago and found that there was a 0% correlation between whether or not the majority of the population agreed with the policy and whether or not Congress passed it. So that is a huge problem, and it's really hard to have political justice when you have a government that uh, doesn't include the voices of the public. So. My website is called rebirthdemocracy.com. It's not called Liam Madden for Congress, right? The core message, the central focus of my campaign is about innovating better problem solving in government. So how do we have better, uh, you know, I could, I could go on for an hour about what political justice means and how to create a more inclusive democratic process that solves complex problems better. Um, but without political and economic justice, there can be no other kind of justice, and I think once we do those things better, then it flows into any other form of justice. It's such a great question. I'm so glad that you asked it. And it cuts across um, all of the work that any of us will be doing if we are successful in going to Congress. It's not just related to issues around, around climate. And um, the very basic place where so many of us need to start, and it's sad that we have to start at such a basic level, but it's true that we have to admit that there is racial inequity, there is structural inequity, and it has been a part of this nation from before its inception. And when you really accept that and understand that, you don't see the world, you don't see government, you don't see the work that you do day to day in the same way. And two books that have been incredibly influential in my life in um, thinking carefully about these issues, one being the book Cast by Isabel, um, Isabel Wilkerson. And she says she likens our country to a house and its frame is rotting. And that if you don't deal with the rotting frame, there is nothing. And that book um, reinforced in me this sense of some of the most important we can, work we can do as climate champions, as people who care about making just transitions, is we've got to have these really hard conversations with fellow Vermonters who don't believe that racism is still an issue. And I say we have to do that first because I see the comments. We just passed the... Um, the environmental justice bill. You read the comments on social media. Why do we need this? Why are you wasting time on this? Why are you spending time on just transitions? Why isn't the Climate Council doing more important work? We've got a problem here with bringing people into this work and having them understand that this has to be central to the work that we do. I'm out of time. Molly. It's hard to as the senator said, to package up an answer in two minutes, but I wanted to approach it through a couple of different aspects. I guess one, 
the process? What is the process of change? And what is the process of change when it comes to addressing um, social and racial and economic injustice, not only in the state, in our communities, but also in this country? Um, for me, as Lieutenant Governor, it started with um, a seat at the table series and trying to figure out which issues were not being discussed or I didn't think they were coming to the forefront of, of our discourse and our, our state and our communities. Um, but then who wasn't at the table and how to get those folks to the table. And in my case, it was a virtual table. Um, and doing that throughout the legislative session, bringing up, for example, uh, public health access for our new refugee, our former refugee, new Vermonter community, um, trying to address some of the systemic barriers we have, some of the systemic racism that still exists in the state in so many different forms. But I want to step back to a bigger issue and topic and, and level that goes far beyond that. Um, that is, my first point was really about process, which is how I see leadership and how um, I lead, but the second is around fundamental human rights, or fundamental rights as we've uh, uh, diagnosed them or accepted them in this country, be it reproductive rights, be it voting rights, um, be it marriage equality, and just where we are at as a democracy right now, where we're going to see in the coming weeks, we don't know, maybe in the coming days, a Supreme Court decision that might overturn Roe v. Wade, and everything that we know Everything that we know, and I know as a human rights lawyer and as an attorney, is now called into question. And so we're in a moment where we have to dig really deep and fight extremely hard just to hold on to that which is fundamental. So we are really very much at this moment in the fight of our lives. Well, if you like that question, you're going to love this one. Um, our democracy certainly seems like it is at a precipice. Um, what are you planning to do in Congress to ensure we continue to have free and fair elections in Vermont and across the nation? I'm going to start with Becca. This is something that I have thought about so much on the campaign trail that I do feel like we are at um, a crisis of democracy. I do feel like the republic is in danger. I was sworn in as uh, President Pro Tem on the day that the insurrection at the Capitol happened. And it was incredibly jarring to take um, a leadership position in the Senate on the day that I saw a wave of authoritarianism and fascism rear, rear its head. We do need to tend to the democracy. It is not hyperbole to say that we are at a very, very frightening moment. And so, of course, there are things that um, are out of our hands right now. None of us are in Congress right now. But we need to see the work of the January 6th Commission through to conclusion. People need to be held accountable for their actions that day. We have to make sure we as Vermonters are not just working hard to make sure the ballot is accessible here in Vermont, which we've done an incredibly great job here. Uh, your legislative leadership in conjunction with Secretary of State's office has made it incredibly easy to vote, which is how it should be in every single zip code across the nation. So, but we as Vermonters, we need to make sure that we are putting our energy into making sure everyone across the nation has um, that same access. And basic level, you know, we have to get the corruption out of Congress. We have way too much big money in politics right now. We see what happened to Build Back Better. We see what happened with Joe Manchin and his ties to Big Coal. He's not the only one. We have got to, um, I'm out. We've got to take back the country. That's what I'm trying to say here, and time's up. Molly. We need our leadership in Washington on voting rights now more than ever. We see across this country, as many of us probably know, uh, the restrictions on same-day registration, states where same-day registration, which is so important for young people on the move, moving from school to school or internship to internship to be able to show up at a voting place and to register and then to vote, which is something we did here in Vermont, that is now being banned in certain states across this country. Um, vote by mail. 
vote by mail during a pandemic that's still going is now being rolled back in states across this country. Thank goodness we have it in Vermont for our general elections. I hope, as Senator Ballant knows, that we have it in the future for primary elections. We won't have it for this primary. So request your ballot. Don't forget to request your absentee ballot. But we need desperately right now to, to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act to bring people across the aisle together in Washington to make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect access to the ballot box. And also, I'll end with this. I was also uh, sworn in the day after the insurrection. And I felt very compelled quickly to try to do something with my office, to try to help our democracy um, stay alive, and especially here in Vermont. And I started a thing called Lieutenant Governor for a Day, which is every Wednesday bringing kids from across the state classrooms into the state virtually, just to give them a feeling of connection, a feeling of connection. And where I think we have connection, we have a feeling of ownership. And where we have ownership, we feel trust and we feel a deep need to preserve. And so I also think it's incumbent upon all of us right now to get as many people feeling connected and feeling a sense of ownership over this democracy that's so deeply, deeply fragile. Uh, so I'll start with some specific stuff. Uh, same day registration is a gimme, a given. Um, the idea of um, just automatically being registered as soon as you graduate from high school, I think that's a given. I, th I see most voter ID laws as a new form of Jim Crow, and I oppose them. And I'm, of course, for vote, for vote by mail. Uh, to be a little bit more innovative, we've probably all heard of ranked choice voting and proportional representation and election finance reform, and I think those are a good start. But when I'm talking about rebirthing democracy, I think it goes much deeper, and I think you need to think about, first of all, the two-party system is an obstruction to doing anything innovative or, or significant enough to solve our problems. The two-party system does not represent us. It doesn't solve our problems. <laughs> it drives us to extremes, and it is fundamentally controlled by elites. So we need to liberate ourselves from the two-party system. And one pathway I see to that is to make ballot initiatives, which over 30 states have, accessible on the federal level online, because there's no reason we need to wait every two years to have public input on matters of importance. And I also think we need um, forums where people can discuss ideas and generate solutions, and if there's enough support from within uh, a forum, that it automatically gets put to legislators to make a meaningful action on. And just like Facebook is driven by big tech that creates echo chambers and drives polarization, that same big tech, that same AI, can be pointed in the opposite direction to highlight what transcends the most values, it can be a tool to create inspired cooperation. And I think we need that kind of technology. So we need to expand our imagination of what is actually needed to create cooperation at scale. Uh, and then lastly, I would say, you know, one of the refreshing things about what's happening right now is that new ideas and new blood are entering political conversation, and what we could be doing is committing to term limits. So I'm not for just working for term limits, but committing to them right here. So I want to know, Becca and Molly, would you commit to an eight-year maximum term of service in the U.S. House of Representatives? Unfortunately, yeah, it's not debate, so yeah we're, all we're right. Not going to debate it. Good try, though, Liam. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, we will transition to the next question. Uh, your time was almost up, anyhow. Uh, Vermont became a refuge for many folks during COVID 19 and has already begun to see climate migrants move into the state, which has put increasing pressure on uh, our already tight housing market. Uh, this is resulting in increased pressure for developing our working lands and forests. So what specifically would you do to simultaneously protect our natural resources while also expanding access and availability, availability of affordable housing in Vermont? And again, you only have two minutes on this one, so I know. Molly, you get to go first. I think this is one of the biggest challenges we face as a state right now. Uh, I ran for lieutenant governor because of our demographic crisis and experiencing firsthand what it was like to try to find an apartment, try to find a place to live uh, on a salary working as an assistant attorney general with student loan debt and also working a second job at night just to afford both. 
I know right now, as we think about our workforce crisis, the number of employers I talk to who say, Molly, we have offered wonderful jobs to folks outside of the state to come to the state, and they are turning them down because they cannot find housing. They can't find housing in Burlington. They can't find housing in Montpelier. They can't find housing in Newport or in Bennington or anywhere in between. So I think our biggest challenge is how do we build? How do we build? How do we expand access to housing right now? Um, I am a strong believer that we need to build up and not out, that we need to think about housing that's going to be sustainable, weatherized, safe, accessible, um, and really looking at the spectrum of housing that we have in Vermont. We have Vermonters right now who need access to uh, supported and independent living. We simply don't have enough. We have Vermonters who are living in family homes and want to move into family homes that just aren't available. So how are we um, building and making those more affordable, accessible? But I think our biggest challenge right now is we try to welcome workers and keep young people who are graduating from our colleges and universities in the state is access to worker housing. I'm a strong believer that where Congress can step in and provide support now is one, as I mentioned earlier, in building the workforce, two, in making sure that we have the money to invest in water and sewer. Uh, we don't right now even have the basic infrastructure support. We've received some money for that, but um, not enough. And there's a way for us to do this while we also protect and preserve our land and environment, our forests and our fields, our streams. Um, I know we can do it. Um, here in the state well, but we absolutely have to have the federal funding. Yeah, yeah so it's, imagine all three of us agree that there's just simply not enough housing, one way or the other. Um, this is a big subject, it's like education. Are we talking about pre-K or graduate students? So which population are we talking about housing for? I think is, um, it's hard to put it all in, in one two minute section, but if I were to make an overarching statement to give you an idea of where I'm coming from, I would say that rent is to housing as wage slavery is to employment. And it's not to say all employment is wage slavery, and it's not to say that all rent is extractive, but by and large, rent is a pretty exploitative dynamic, and we should be more skeptical of it morally, and perhaps outraged by it. Um, so what I would do to address it is that we need at least a pilot scale version of a federal 0% loan program so that people can access housing that is part of smart development, tying into how we respond to our sustainability crisis. So those means clustered, well-insulated, energy-efficient homes. And I think those same 0% loans should be even further subsidized for people who are part of workers' cooperatives or democratically engaged businesses, as well as people engaged in agriculture and maybe some other um, different activities. But in the meantime, while we're not changing a paradigm just yet, I think uh, the existing legislation that is catching my eye is what uh, Representative Ilhan Omar is pushing forward in the Homes for All Act. And that's the kind of legislation that I would uh, immediately work to support. But in the bigger picture, we need to be thinking about how the affordable housing crisis is probably best solved by creating a civilian service corps with, you know, I was part of the Marine Corps, we should have that but we should also have a building core. We should also have a regenerative agriculture core. And we should also have a healthcare core. So I think those problems can solve each other, giving people meaningful work and career pathways and educational benefits through civilian service that also solves the problem of uh, creating affordable housing. Thank you. Uh, Becca? I first got Test. I first got interested in the issue of housing uh, before I even served in the Senate because I saw firsthand as a middle school teacher for years what happened when my students didn't have safe, stable housing. It impacted their learning. It impacted their mental health. It impacted their ability to be, to be present and to succeed. And so at a baseline, you know, we have to make sure that we are uh, guaranteeing that Vermont families have safe, affordable housing. Now, under my leadership, both as majority leader and then as president pro tem, was able to make the largest investments in new housing in decades. We did not anticipate the COVID refugees. 
We did not anticipate how it, the housing uh, market could tighten even further because it was already tight. But where we can look to the federal government for supports, I've, you know, my colleagues have mentioned some of them. Certainly we need more federal dollars for water and sewer to make sure that we are building where we want building to happen in downtown uh, and village centers, which is what we've been doing in Vermont for years, really focused on smart growth. That's how it should be. We're also investing a lot of money in rehabbing our housing stock. We have some of the oldest housing stock in the nation here in Vermont. And because of that, we have some of the uh, housing that is the leakiest in terms of weatherization. So th th these issues go together. We've also been investing in accessory dwelling units. And I know that that's another way that we can bring union, you, new units online quickly. Uh, the other thing that we've looked at in Vermont is doing some version of tax increment financing for smaller municipalities. Smaller towns and cities want to build more housing and they don't have the money to do so. Thank you. Uh, in less than an hour, President Biden is going to deliver an address to the nation about the recent mass shootings. Uh, news reports say that he's going to be stressing the urgent need for Congress to pass gun restrictions. What specific federal legislation would you support to reduce gun violence in America? And we're going to start with you, Liam. Okay, so I uh, am a former Marine, so I understand what the difference between uh, an assault rifle is and um, what people have in their imagination when they hear the word assault rifle. Um, most tragedies probably could have happened or did happen with weapons that don't even qualify as assault rifles. So um, it's important to expand the conversation a little to understand what would actually be effective policy and prevent these types of tragedies. Uh, one, we need severe restrictions on any mentally ill person having access to firearms. Two, um, the Second Amendment, it should stay intact. And I think the House legislation in Vermont that, that made it illegal for 18 to 20 year olds to access guns is actually unconstitutional. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm not saying I'm opposed to it ethically. I'm saying it's just unconstitutional and you need to call a spade a spade. Nowhere does it say that people over 18 to 20 uh, have the right to bear arms. But that said, the right to bear arms is the worst punctuated amendment ever. Um, and it, it implies a well-regulated militia, which means that there's a community of ethics that goes along with having a firearm that imposes discipline about using deadly force. And I think we need that kind of local community of ethics so that we can verify who on uh, our community levels is actually known to be responsible enough to have the kind of weapon that is capable of doing dangerous things. I think handguns and uh, hunting rifles need less regulation, but regulations are needed for weapons that have more military application. And I think that should happen on a local scale because the way hunter-gatherers solve this problem is to have complete transparency over society so that everyone knew everybody. <laughs> and it was clear who was going down a dangerous path, who was unwell. And we need that kind of heightened transparency that's not from government surveillance, but from communities that know each other and can verify each other's wellness. Becca. Prior to my serving in the Senate and being the majority leader, we had no gun safety laws on the books in Vermont, none. And it was uh, a goal of mine to make sure that we passed a package of gun safety measures um, while I was in that leadership position. I had um, my dear friend Ann Braden was the one who founded Gun Sense Vermont, and I was actually the first person to donate money to get that organization off the ground. And I want to say to you, this issue has been important to me long before I was in this role as senator. I've done some great work in this role, but as a parent and also as a teacher, being a teacher during the time when school shootings became commonplace, my job changed the way my, the parents who dropped their kids off at school changed. This is not the price that we have to pay for liberty, watching our children get slaughtered. We can make a difference. We've made some great changes here. We can do it at the federal level. 
banning automatic assault rifles, AR-15s, putting a limit on magazines, closing the Charleston loophole, making sure there's handgun waiting period, more red flag laws, uh, looking at the suicide rate here in Vermont, we're an outlier for men taking their lives with firearms. We should be doing more. And the, the last thing I have to say, and I know it's not a debate, but I just have to say, there is no connection between mental health concerns and people who commit these violent crimes. We have seen it time and time again. The research does not bear it out. And I just have to say, it is a disservice when we say that. Thank you. Molly? I've been uh, thinking a lot about why is it? Why is it right now that Congress just cannot act? Why? Why is it when Russia invades Ukraine and is killing civilians and inciting genocide, according to recent reports, that we can come together as a country to protect, to try to protect people, to provide aid and assistance, but right now, across the United States, where children are being killed in schools, where individuals are being targeted, targeted because of the color of their skin, in grocery stores, individuals are being targeted in places of worship because of their religious beliefs, and there have been shootings since Uvalde, in Tulsa, as we know. How is it that we cannot come together right now as a nation across party lines to act? Um, I'm glad that the president is giving a speech tonight. Um, I 100% support the reforms that were mentioned just now by my colleague, um, red flag laws at the national level. We do not need weapons of war on our streets banning assault rifles. Universal background checks, closing the Charleston loophole, addressing hate crimes, addressing them, prosecuting them, recognizing that there is a, a frightening movement, frightening movement across this country right now around violent extremism, homegrown terrorism. We, could, we should call it terrorism because that is what it is. Gun violence will not be addressed by simply one action. This is a come together across this country, across political divides, to try to protect each other and care for each other and stop what is a very terrifying, very, very terrifying trend. Thank you, all three of you. Um, President Biden has a plan to fight inflation that includes a plan to invest in clean energy to help people cut their energy bills by $500 a year. We are seeing inflation hitting us, hitting our pocketbooks every day, more and more. How would you plan to simultaneously address our current economy, inflation, and climate change? You only have two minutes, so go for it. Uh, we're going to start with you, Becca. So I want to start by saying um, I know that this is um, a challenging time for those of us who have been working really hard on carbon reduction and have um, wanted to work hard to uh, join Vermont to the Transportation Climate Initiative and uh, whether it's um, movement towards a carbon tax or carbon dividend is very difficult in this climate to have that conversation, but we have to continue to have that conversation long term despite the inflation, because we know the, the, the prices, especially on fossil fuels, are going to continue to be volatile. And so they're up now. They're going to be down. It's, it is challenging. Um, we have got to be courageous and pass laws that are targeting the companies that are reaping huge benefits right now from these increased prices, and not just fossil fuels. Certainly, you know, price gouging uh, is not just happening within fossil fuels, but we should have a windfall tax on fossil fuel companies, and we should use that money to reinvest in uh, initiatives that will help us reduce our dependency on fossil fuels. And 
Steve, I just want to make sure I hit all of the things that you're talking about. There were many parts to your question. Yeah, no, that was pretty good. Okay. <laughs> uh, Molly. This is such a tough, tough question right now. I was at the pump and filling up myself, and $87 is a lot right now to fill up a tank. Uh, there was a woman next to me the other day who had two kids in the back of the car. She was um, in a, uh, uh, not a minivan, but a car that um, all-wheel drive, you know, and uh, she just started swearing. She started swearing at the pump, and I was right there with her, and I think that we're all experiencing that right now. And so I see it as short-term, medium-term, and long-term steps. One, we have to make sure that right now um, Vermonters can still pay for food and pay for rent and pay for heat. The number of Vermonters who have reached out to my office who are on a fixed income right now in Social Security are saying it is just not going far enough. So making sure that we stabilize, that folks have enough to get by um, the day-to-day -day right now. Um, second, and sort of the medium, medium term, doing everything we can to support a just transition. So increase in investments in weatherization, increase investments in access to electric vehicles. Um, I would love to afford one and can't wait to get my hands on one um, when that's financially possible and they're available. Um, doing everything we can right now to get more Vermonters uh, access to heat pumps. And, and then in the longer term, I 100% support, and, and I think it could happen even sooner, ending fossil fuel subsidy, subsidies and then reinvesting as much of that money as we can right now into supporting um, a just transition. Thank you. Liam. All right, up front, inflation is a very complex subject, and I don't know everything I need to know about how to tackle it, but I do know that we should tack uh, the minimum wage and federal benefits and any federal jobs guarantees to the rate of inflation. That seems like a, a no-brainer. Uh, we should tax billionaires. I totally agree with Becca. And we should tax the windfalls that they're, they're reaping from heightened inflation. Uh, and I think in the big picture, we need to think about local supply chains. And that ties directly into how we approach climate change, because it's not just about can we um, reduce our emissions. It's about can we meet our needs more locally and more regionally, and we need to make those investments to do that. Um, so I think inflation is one way to deal with inflation is to focus less on money, which is this abstract thing that's values changes all the time, and actually focus on the needs of people, right? So we could just buy a bunch of gasoline and make sure that everyone has access to it at a less inflated rate <laughs> um, at a certain portion of, you know, at a certain ration to people, or we could, you know, do the same thing with other basic needs like food or heating fuel. Um, so that's another way to deal with inflation is to just meet people's needs instead of uh, trying to keep up with the um, treadmill of inflation that spirals away from us. So uh, I'll just recap that, tack federal benefits and wages as best possible to inflation, tax billionaires and their windfalls, and relocalize supply chains. Thank you. Uh, one final question before we go to the closing statements. Um, climate anxiety, especially for young people, is real and it's becoming, it feels debilitating and daunting. What do you say to young people to give them hope for a bright future and habitable planet? And what will you commit to and to them to address the crisis at the scale and pace that the challenge actually requires? Molly. Yeah. I'm now a proud stepmom to an 11 and 13 year old, and they've got some pretty big questions. Um, I'm 38, and what I've already seen in my a short lifetime gives me great cause for concern, knowing that we're going to have a month less of winter and maybe in the next, what, two generations? We see tick-borne illness. Maple sugaring may be a thing of the past. I don't know about farming, but I know at home we're putting up a lot more greenhouses because the only way you can account for incredibly diverse and extreme weather patterns. Uh, what I tell young people is, you know, one, the commitment to action true commitment to action. Two, um, trying to incentivize right now that if you are interested in climate action, that also means deploying solar panels. 
and helping to be part of the workforce that is so desperately needed right now to meet our climate goals. Whether at home weatherizers, heat pump installers, electric vehicle technicians, and that action comes in a lot of deep, tangible ways. And how do we make sure that those are the jobs that the next generation feels excited about and supported about? Um, I feel very strongly and will stand by our commitments in the Paris Agreement. We can't go it alone as Vermonters, as Americans. We have to be standing by our words, standing by our obligations, but then working with the global community consistently, not just with one administration and another, um, showing up every single day. Um, and certainly um, doing everything we can to make climate action truly accessible to every Vermonter, regardless of income, regardless of where they live in the state. Um, that is on us as leaders. That is on us as future members of Congress, as federal leaders, that we have to remove all the barriers to getting Vermonters um, into all of the tools and having access to them to do meaning meaningful climate action now. So a friend of mine is related to Wendell Berry, and she was expressing some despair and grief. And he said to her, the world needs us too much to despair. So I think that's one thing I would say to young people. Um, it's not to have an optimism that's naive or not rooted in reality, but to have an optimism that says, your fear, your grief, your sadness is a good thing. It means you're still alive and, it, and you still care. Uh, it reminds me of the quote, I don't know if you guys ever heard this guy, Krishnamurti, very wise dude. He said, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. So uh, young people who are despairing, I, I feel you. And I think one of the things I, I agree with Molly, we should um, feel those feelings fully, but also invest in action because I just lost a brother a few months ago to addiction. And uh, I think having a meaningful life is part of how we respond to this feeling of despair, this feeling of uh, angst and anxiety about climate change. And what, one of the ways that federal policy can tie into that is through a large scale military sized uh, civilian service corps that makes sure that we're giving people pathways to enrich themselves and contribute to the world in ways we all agree that we need. So, um, yeah, I feel, I feel your despair, but I don't think it's all a bad thing. And I think we can, if we think at the right scale of action, we can work together to uh, respond appropriately. Becca. You just have to say it. Well, I don't, there we go. <laughs> Just have to say, I've really enjoyed hearing uh, both the Lieutenant Governor and Liam's um, thoughts at the end of this. It's been a really thoughtful evening. And I think we all feel similarly in that we are balancing our grief and our worry and our despair um, with hopefully a sense that we cannot give up hope, right? All, all will be lost. And, one of the things that I talk about with, with my kids, so I have, I have an 11 year old and a 14 year old, and uh, we talk a lot at the dinner table about current events. And the other day uh, we were talking about issues around, around climate change and, and my son in particular was feeling very overwhelmed. And you know, I reminded him that when I was his age, I never thought that I'd be able to marry my spouse. There, it was not gonna be a possibility for me. There was gonna be, you know, what I felt were insurmountable obstacles in allowing me to marry my um, same-sex partner. And so I always bring that up with them, that you don't know what's around the corner. You just don't know. And we have to believe that change is possible. And as Liam said, not in a naive way, but that I believe 
in human creativity. I believe in human resiliency. And I had a fantastic conversation the other night with someone at a meet and greet who was so fired up about biochar. He talked to me about biochar for about a half hour. And I was so excited about it that I went home and did a whole bunch of reading about it because I felt like I need to know about this. And other, and, and I know some of you out there are gonna go look it up now, that we are an incredibly resilient people. And yes, we've made horrible mistakes. And the people that are bearing the incredible costs of climate change are the people with the least amount of means to cope with it. But when I feel despair, I listen to someone who I, I mentioned earlier, Catherine Hayhoe. She always gives me hope, always. Thank you. Well, now we're going to turn to the closing statements and uh, sticking with the, the rotation that we have uh, adhered to up to this point, uh, that would put Liam first. So, Liam. I really appreciate being up here with Beck and Molly, and I think what they want to do is have you believe that their experience tells you a lot about their leadership abilities. But I would say that theirs is the experience of being servants to a broken two-party system. And I ask, would you trust the experience of a doctor who doesn't heal her patients? Would you trust a doctor who has a lot of experience prescribing Band-Aids for gushing wounds? Because if you want a Green New Deal at the hands of the Democratic Party's leadership, I want you to expect to climate change what Obamacare was to health, which was at least a tragically lost opportunity and perhaps a disgraceful half measure. So I ask, do we want their experience or do we need innovation and vision? And I have a logical set of policy outlines that can bring democracy into the 21st century. Because we must innovate our collective problem solving systems on a structural and technological level to deal with sustainability at the root cause, which is our economic system. And the only way to transform to a steady state economy, one that values our planet and our people and our principles as more sacred than just profit, is to create a robust and wise democratic process so that we can all be involved and have public buy-in about what needs to happen. Because I promise you this, the future will belong to those who are using the most advanced technology effectively. And right now that means the future belongs to either unaccountable authoritarian governments around the world or unaccountable tech oligarchs, mostly right here at home. But if we want the future to belong to the people of this planet, then we must empower and refine how open and free societies embrace the technology and the mindsets needed to paradigm shift our collective problem solving. I'm asking you, do you believe that changing the players is enough? Or do you know in your heart that we must change the rules of the game? And I'm asking you to listen to your heart and join us in rebirthing democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Becca. Can you hear me? Okay, great. This has been a really, really interesting conversation and I've uh, enjoyed the evening together. I wasn't sure how many people would come out and I think this is really a testament to Vermont that so many people came out tonight. I wanna say that one of the most important things I want you to know about me, and what drives me in my work, is I fundamentally, I love people. I really love people. I love serving my community. I love serving my state. And I think I've been quite effective at leading on these issues that you care so much about. Um, I have a 100% voting record on the scorecard that VCV puts out over the course of my career, from environmental justice to ban on PFAS, medical monitoring, lead contamination in drinking water, safe elections, Global Warming Solutions Act, and on and on and on. I have been a partner with this organization and with VNRC for years, and I feel it so deeply that it's some of the most important work that, that I've done. And I want to say that we all can be leaders on this issue. We are running for this office up here, but the real action that we're going to take on climate is gonna be happening in each of your communities, in really meaningful conversations with your neighbors, with your children, in your kids' schools, talking with people who have different views than you have, 
because we all want to live in a world that is safe and healthy. We all want that. And there's so much that we can use to bridge the gap between us on these issues. And that is something that I've done my whole life, not just in state government, but my whole life, trying to make that connection. And that's what I will do as your next congressperson. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Molly. I also just want to echo tremendous thanks to Steve. Thank you. Um, Vermont Conservation Voters, VNRC. I don't know where Brian went. He's in the back. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, this is a make or break moment for us. And I feel like we say that nearly every election. But I'm starting to believe that this really is a make or break moment, be it with a continuous war raging in Ukraine, with gun violence on the rise across this country. We talked about that tonight. The real palpable impact of climate change. Democracy hanging by a thread. And I think we are here, and what gives me hope is that we all believe there is a path forward, and we want to be part of that. And that's what's hopeful and exciting about this moment. What I bring to the table, I'm not a career politician. Um, a lifelong uh, experience here in Vermont, um, a lot of different chapters, working and living in our communities, growing up here, which I feel very, very privileged to have. Um, nearly half a decade working in and with Congress, not only helping to set up and run Congress and Welch's office, but working for the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, working internationally in some really tough places, fighting for human rights overseas in Baghdad and Iraq and Nigeria, um, serving as a lawyer in the Attorney General's office, but also as a federal law clerk at a time where we really need fundamental rights to be protected and fought for. So it is a diversity of experience in a moment where we have a big diversity of challenges, and we need Congress to deliver for us as Vermonters in a big way, but also for us as a country in a big way. So I look forward to staying around and chatting with you tonight, but having many, many more conversations in the days, weeks, and months ahead. And thank you for coming, and I hope to earn your support in this extremely consequential election. Uh, thank everybody for being so patient and, and and for such a lively conversation. It really was very interesting. And um, on behalf of myself and the Times Argus and the Rutland Herald, I want to thank Becca Balent, Molly Gray, and Liam Madden for being here this evening. Please give them a round of applause. Hi everyone. Oh, sorry. Hi everyone. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Becca, Molly, and Liam, and thank you, Alex, for keeping time for us so well. Um, I'm going to say a couple words, but before that, I just wanted to take a moment to invite any other congressional candidates that may be here with us in the room this evening. Um, if they would like to take a couple minutes to stand up and introduce themselves, you're welcome to come up on stage and have the microphone. <laughs> No, I'll just, I'll just take here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sinead Chase Clifford. I wasn't able to participate in, uh, up on stage this evening, but I am here because these are issues deeply important to me, and I'm excited to spend the next, I think, hour or so meeting and greeting with you all and sharing a little bit about myself. Um, I may be a little bit of a new face to some folks who have been with VCV and V and RC. <laughs> Um, but I am so excited to get to know you and hear from you what's important in, in this election. Of course, we heard a lively discussion about those issues, but would love to talk to you about what I see, my vision for our climate and ecological future, as well as addressing many of the justice challenges that were uh, talked about tonight. So very excited to have an opportunity to talk with you, and um, thank you for a great discussion as well. Thanks.
Thank you, Shanae. And if there are any other candidates for any office who would like to introduce themselves before we move into the meet and greet portion of the evening, you're welcome to come up and do so. Jared. Jared. <laughs> Thank you, Greta. Thank you, uh, Vermont Conservation Voters and Vermont Natural Resources Council. Um, my name is Jared Duval. I am a candidate here in the Democratic primary uh, for State Senate to represent Washington County, Stowe, Orange, and Braintree. And uh, climate and clean energy work has been my life's work uh, for the last 20 years. Um, have been serving on Vermont's Climate Council as a co-author of Vermont's Climate Action Plan, uh, currently direct the Energy Action Network, which is a statewide network working towards Vermont's um, climate, energy, economic, and equity goals, um, and have been doing this work since I was a student organizer in high school, um, similar to uh, uh, Senator Ballant I was honored to just receive an endorsement from my longtime organizing colleague, uh, Bill McKibben, last week. Um, and would just invite anybody who's interested to learn more. Uh, my website is jaredduvalvt.com. Um, there's more about um, who I am, why I'm running, and um, positions on the issues. So thank you. And I will also be sticking around and would love to have conversations uh, with, with you all. Thank you. All right, is there anyone else out there? Okay. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Ann Watson. I am, oh, okay, check, hello. Test, test. One, two. I can also just speak really loudly. That's also possible. I'll give it one more shot here. Hello, check, check, one, two. <laughs> test, test. All right, that's okay. <laughs> are they, are, yeah, are they? Hello, check, Bye. check. Oh, oh, does this yours work? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it will in a second. Oh. Is, it, is it working now? That's okay. My name is Ann Watson. I am also running for state senate. Uh, to represent also Washington County, uh, Stowe, Orange, and Braintree. Uh, I am running because every day I work with high school students that are worried about climate change. I have been a teacher at the high school in Montpelier for uh, 17 years teaching physics and engineering and mathematics. And uh, so uh, especially dealing with uh, energy every day. Uh, I, it's something that I think about uh, all the time. And I am really very passionate about uh, climate issues and making a difference, especially uh, transitioning in a just way for Vermont, uh, being able to find ways to center um, minorities as well as uh, the, the poor, uh, who are the, the most impacted and the least able to adapt uh, both to the effects of climate change and to uh, uh, being able to make adjustments that might be needed to get off of fossil fuels. Um, in addition, I hear also, I'm also the, the mayor of Montpelier um, right now, and, and from the constituents that I uh, hear in Montpelier, um, I hear also uh, frequently about uh, just the economic issues that <clears throat> are uh, really troubling in a society right now in terms of uh, the lack of uh, affordable, high-quality childcare, uh, the lack of paid family leave, um, and the, the affordable housing. Um, these are issues that, as mayor, I've worked on and we've made progress on. We've actually been able to enact um, some policies that have made progress, and that's very exciting. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to taking those ideas to the state and uh, working together with uh, fellow senators and uh, the legislature as a whole. Uh, so I, I'm also, uh, I've got a, a website, um, Ann Watson for VTSenate.com, uh, and um, I, I will also be sticking around, so happy to chat with anyone afterwards as well. Um, so th thank you very much for the opportunity to, to uh, introduce myself. <laughs> So they're not necessarily
necessarily running against each other. Okay, so I just wanted to know that. And um, the other thing that I want to say is the job that they do will be incredibly important, and I hope that you'll take time to talk to each of them. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for being here, for coming out in person, and for joining us tonight for this wonderful conversation about all the issues that are so important to all of us. Um, I don't think I introduced myself when I first came up here, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but I'm Greta Hassler. I'm the Energy and Climate Program Associate at Vermont Natural Resources Council. Um, and I just wanted to, to say that this work with um, the forum here tonight is just one component of Vermont Conservation Voters and Vermont Natural Resources Council's work. Um, but we also do a lot of work throughout the year around important policy issues and legislative advocacy. Um, so it's really, we're, we just want to say thank you so much for being here tonight. And if you bought a ticket to come out and support our work, thank you so much. And if you would like to consider supporting our work more long term, becoming a sustaining donor, um, you can do so at the back table in the back of the room with the green tablecloth. Um, and now we're going to move into the meet and greet portion of this evening. There's a cash bar in the back, and there's also food back there, which you're welcome to help yourselves to as you mingle and meet the candidates. Thank you all so much.